to determine if they're eligible. Sometimes you have to look at their income to determine uh, what their rent is, um, but that's different than using it for eligibility. So at this time, we haven't looked into that at a national level. None of the COC program or ESG programs are integrated into that. Um, I'd have to do a little bit more research at our level to see if that's even a possibility. And is that question specifically, and I'm asking Jessica this, are you looking at more for like the um, permanent support of like the voucher side for utilizing the income verification so they can continue to do the, um, you know, to, to determine tenant portion? Okay, that, that, that's why that, that's where it would make sense. Ah, uh, um, well, I guess the answer is we haven't looked at it at our level, but um, let me see if there's any work underway or can be to do that going forward. Uh, if, if no one else has a question, I have another one. <laughs> Mine come up, you know, and, and just to be fair, I, I look at, you know, I, my questions are through the FPM lens. So I look at interagency cooperation, that kind of thing. So I'm just curious, Brett, since we have your undivided attention, um, <laughs> what um, have you seen or, you know, can you, do you have any examples of uh, interagency cooperation, like working with EDI grants or, you um, FEMA grants to take congregate housing, congregate living facilities and converting them over to non-congregate. Is that something that you're seeing or have seen or, or something that you, you know, I know it's kind of outside the scope of what we're talking about here a little bit, but it's just, I figured I'd throw the dart out in the dark and see what it's Yeah, what I don't know that I've heard of anything and certainly doesn't mean it's not happening. I don't know that I've heard of anywhere taking a congregate setting and turning it into non-congregate. Um, what we are hearing that some communities are doing is using some of their um, their uh, their CARES Act money, either through um, and I don't remember all the acronyms, but the Treasury money or their CDB CDBG money um, to purchase hotels um, and rehab them with the intent of using them as non congregate sheltering now, but then turning them into permanent housing down the road, whether it be permanent supportive housing or affordable housing. We're seeing a lot of communities looking into that right now and trying to figure out the financing for that. Has there been any, uh, when you start talking about the underwriting and the financing for that, has there been, you know, with the match requirement having been removed, if I understand correctly, has there been any talk about allowing ESG to be used as match for other programs like they do with CDBG? Right. So usually, um, usually it's, so there's nothing in the ESG program or the ESG program statute that prohibits ESG as being used for match for another program. Usually where the prohibitions lie are in the OMB circulars and the implementing regulation of 2 CFR 200. And that's where the, the rules are that you can't match federal funds with other federal funds. So I know CDBG has specific statutory language that waives that. And on the ESG and COC side, we also have language that says you can use other federal funds to match our money unless that 
federal resource prohibits it, but most programs are not going to be allowed to use ESG to match another source of federal money because of the OMB circulars and 2 CFR 200. Well, I, if no one else has any questions, I mean, they, they, um, folks can feel free to, to you know, we'll give you back some of your time. I know everyone's busy. I, we'll stay on the, we'll stay here until uh, 3.15, which is when we're scheduled to be here. So uh, if you do have a question that comes up between now and then, feel free to come back in and ask it. Um, I don't want to keep asking, taking all the time up. So I want to, <laughs> um, you know, I, I want to make sure it's open for others to ask questions. Um, so Again, uh, we thank you for your time and for all, everything, all the great work that you're doing uh, out in the community. Uh, I know it's, it has not been easy. Um, so I, I do uh, I want to make sure it's known that we appreciate We at HUD here appreciate everything that you're doing. Um, and like I said, we'll stay on the line. Uh, the, the materials that are here will be made available through the summit, through the summit organizers. And uh, I'll, I'll give you back some of your time and uh, thank you for attending.
Well, I think it's just all HUD folks and Nicole left. <clears throat> so I guess. <laughs> hey, Bobby, how you doing? I guess. We'll start with that. All right. I think it might be because we do office hours every week. Do people, Brett, do people bring you like, so, I mean, I can't even tell you how many times we hear people, I don't want to say complain, but they all have ideas like, oh, rent, let's change the rental assistance and leasing requirement. And I really thought people would like latch on to that opportunity. Do you guys get those kind of like non-COVID related questions during office hours? Sometimes, yeah. Or through the okay. AAQ or people just email us. Okay, maybe that's we're, what it is. Because We're pretty accessible. I always, I always tell them to ask and then I, 